Hello everybody and welcome to Tariq Time, where we talk about the history of Tigray. Now available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. On this episode, we will be talking about Tigray in the 16th to 19th centuries and the struggle for power within Tigray in Ethiopia. Welcome to Tariq Time. Alrighty. Let's add some people. Trying to figure that out. Okay. Invitation. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Just going to wait for a few more people to show up. Some people to join the live. Oh, is that is that show it? I think I added the wrong show it. Hi, everybody. Just give us a moment. Just waiting for some people to join. Welcome to Tariq time. We're going to be talking about uh, the history of Tigray from the 16th and 19th ish centuries. Hello, Fana. Hello, Sam Hall. Just give us a sec, guys. We're just waiting for some people. Hey. Show it. Hello, hello. Hello. Come in. Dahania. That's about as far as my trigger can go. Same. Okay, so we're on the same level. It's all good. I'm good. We're just waiting on um, Uncle at this point. Hopefully, he, he'll show up. If not, we can move forward. Um, we'll just wait a minute. Today we're going to be talking about Tigray from the 16th to 19th centuries. Did you watch the previous episode, Choweet? I tuned into about half of it, and then I had to go. Half is good. Half is good. <laughs> Listen, well, they're an hour long. I understand. What did you say? I'll catch up this week. Okay, there you go. You'll catch up this week. Hello, Heaven. Hello, who else? Tigray 23, Sennit, just waiting on Uncle. Hopefully Uncle shows up. Because oh, uh, <laughs> I don't have the background knowledge to support you, but I'm going to support those in the comments. Okay, there you go. That's what you'll do. Let me just see if I can send him an invitation. I don't think he's coming. It's going to be me and you. Hey, Maria Menelik. All right. You know what? We can just start. We can get going. And then if Uncle shows up, cool. You sent it to him? Okay. Feb, Feb who sent it to him. Yeah, she's just the host extraordinaire, even when she's not here. Exactly. She's always pulling her weight. Yeah. Hello, Messel. Um. Okay. So last time we talked about um. kind of the church. You know, roughly from when the Shoan dynasty showed up in the 13th century all the way up to, I think, roughly the 1500s. So we're going to be picking up from there. Um, Uncle is always late. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting to know. So one little fact I want to pop out is um, Ethiopia had a Catholic emperor at one point. Did you know that, Shoeit? Yeah, I did. But then his son reversed it. His son reversed it. It was a pretty big deal at the time. Like you can tell how um, how Christian Ethiopia is right now, or at least northern Ethiopia, right? And so imagine some Portuguese people coming, starting a, a Catholic community and managing to convert um, uh, an emperor to Christianity and him making Catholicism the state religion. That's partly, I think, why... Estefanos, did you hear, did you remember anything about Estefanos? No. You don't. Estefanos was the guy who's said to be like uh, the first Tigrayan philosopher and like the first enlightenment enlightenment philosopher in a way, right? 
So he was dealing with some issues in um, um, Aksum at the time. And part of the issues he dealt with that led him to leaving and becoming a, a hermit of sorts and writing his, his treatise was because um, I believe at the time Ethiopia was Catholic and he wasn't quite on board. So, yeah. Um, and I also, after uh, the next emperor reconverted, I think it was Susenos. I could be wrong. Um, the Portuguese continued to be a, a martial community within Tigray and Ethiopia. So they were almost like a separate caste, if that makes sense, right? Portuguese or the Catholics? The Portuguese. Okay. They oh, were like... A, half of them that they created a class. Sorry, I meant to, to say they became like, like almost like their own separate caste, where like they were all within the military, if that makes sense. And they was all it, used... Sorry, what was that? In Ethiopia's military? Yeah, yeah, they were used by the Ethiopian merit, uh, um, sorry, the Ethiopian emperors. They were well trained. Let me just check the time here so we can be careful and see when uh, it's about to end. Um, so, yeah, they were used as like a, a sort of, uh, all the men joined the military and they had their own sort of like unit and they all used guns. That's the first time we really start to see guns being uh, used in a significant way in uh, Ethiopia. And um, eventually, their community, their community was still Catholic, and they were still served by Jesuit priests. Eventually, they were forced to convert to Orthodox Christianity or leave. That's when they sort of disappear from our history. I think there's some conjecture that they moved over to Sudan, and then from there, we don't know. But we do know that a bunch of them decided to just settle in Tigray okay. in different areas. Um, I forget the exact areas. Um, Okay, and then next up is, do you know who Ahmed Grain is? Sounds really familiar, but no. He, is, this a, is this a good character or not? Uh, it depends on who you talk to. Okay. You know, that's the way history works. It depends on who you talk to. Some people are good to others, some are bad to others. So in the 16th century, we, um, there was an invasion by the Adal Sultanate. So that's the Sultanate south of what is uh, Ethiopia. Because at this point, Ethiopia would have been what we call like, Tigray, Amhara, Afar, right? The, the northern part is mostly what would have been Ethiopia. So the southern part, which is now maybe like Harar. Sorry, oh. my bad. <laughs> okay. Um, I thought someone joined us for a second. So Harar and um, parts of Somali and other of the surrounding areas, you know, Oromia, it was a place called the Adal Sultanate, right? So it was Muslim. Uh, and it had been in conflict with the Ethiopian Empire for some time. Um, and eventually, we see they go to war. And this is a serious war. This is the Jihad of Amhar Grain. And Grain, I think, is like a, an Ethiopian sort of like insult. It means like the left-handed, right? Um, because, you know, left is bad in most cultures and right is good. Um, so this doesn't really affect Tigray too much, except at some point we do see him just, he almost, he devastates most of the empire. So he devastates most of the Ethiopian empire, makes it to southern Tigray, and is defeated by the, so we've gone back a little bit, he's defeated by the first group of Portuguese mercenaries that came at the behest of um, the Ethiopian emperor. Um, and they brought matchlock rifles with them. There was only 300 of them, and we spoke about this a little before. The leader was Cristavo da Gama, the son of Vasco da Gama, the explorer. Okay? And they helped turn the tide in favor of the Ethiopian Empire in uh, many battles and helped defeat the Adal, uh, Adalite, uh, Sultanate of Adal. So the interesting thing about that for, from Tigray's perspective is it weakened the Ethiopian Empire, a lot. And what we see happen right after that is the Oromo invasions. So we see many lands that um, um, are now part of Oromia were starting to be settled at that time because both the Adal Sultanate and the Ethiopian Empire were severely weakened by the previous war. So the Oromo start invading from what's now so southern Oromia and uh, they were really great horsemen. They managed to conquer different areas of what is uh, uh, modern-day Ethiopia. They assimilated different groups. 
They moved into many parts of Amhara uh, and what is now Oromia. And they even moved into southern um, Tigray. So Raya. Do you know where the name Raya comes from? No, but I'm sure you know. <laughs> so Raya is actually an Oromo clan. So they have clans, oh. right? So they have different clans like Yaju, Raya, Borena, and what have you. Raya is the name of uh, uh, um, an Oromo clan. And so they settled that area. Eventually, it was reconquered by a Tigrayan uh, uh, leader, and but the name stuck, right? And that's why there's a lot of confusion about the area and who it belongs to. We won't get into too much of that. Um, so then what happens? So then we move on to a very, very interesting period. So um, the Zeman and Misafent. Do you know about the Zeman and Misafent? Yeah, that's the era of the princes. Okay, what do you know? Can you tell, even if it's just a little bit, what do you know about the era of the princes? So what I know is that at this time, the cent, like the central Ethiopian state fell apart and um, into small like micro kingdoms ruled by various princes. Very close. Um, someone has a question in the comments. Guys, sorry to remind you, if you have a question, put it in the question box. And then we can get to it uh, uh, later. Shawit is basically a teacher. Yep. She's the new <laughs> Memher. <laughs> so <laughs> the era of the princes is uh, the name given to a point in time in which the Ethiopian emperors lost uh, power. They were still there, but they were like figureheads. Very similar to the, the a period in Japanese. There's an interesting parallel between Japanese and Ethiopian history. So... I think at roughly the same time, the Portuguese were converting Japanese people to Christianity. And there was a dynasty called the Showan dynasty, I'm pretty sure. In Japan. In Japan. Really? Yeah. And I think afterwards they had a similar period where the emperors lost power and the person who controlled everything was called the Shogun. I'm not 100% about that, but I think it's, it's, it's uh, I think I might be right and it's, it's an interesting parallel. So... What instigated the Zeman and Misafin? Well, I have, before we even get into that, I have a, a, a bit of a misgiving with that term. The reason being is Zeman and Misafin, the idea that the emperor lost power at this period of time is very interesting to me because if you look at things from the beginning of the Shawan dynasty and when Yakuna Anlak takes power, we don't really see a, a real centralized state for any real long period of time up until then. So that's, let's say, up until the Oromo invasion. So that's like 200-ish years. We see lots of rebellions in Tigray. We see rebellions in uh, Semyon, where it's the Beta Israel kingdom. There was a, they had their own kingdom at one point. Um, uh, we see no fixed capital. So the capital moves around and camps. That's where the term, the, you know, the term for city in Tigrinya or Amhart, do you know what it is? In Tigrinya, it's Katama, right? Yeah, it's the same in Amhark. And that originally, that word meant a military camp. Okay. Right? So they would go, the emperor would go so, with his military. That's how he moved around. He would set up a big camp and his city would sort of like form around it, right? So... My issue with the term, the, the heir of the princess, or that, that, that historical sort of period, as we look at it, is that I don't see any sort of clear break between the area before and after the Zeman and the Safans. To me, it seems more like um, there's, there, the breakdown happened after the, the dissolution of the Aksumite Empire. And it looks to me more like you know, the past 700 years have been a continuation of that, where the Ethiopian state is fragmented at times, a little bit more unitary at times. Um, but let's continue on. So uh, how did the Zeman Masafent in the traditional sense, the traditional understanding, how did it come about? So have you ever heard of Reisi Suhul Mikhail or Ras Suhul Mikhail? Yes, but I, I don't have a, a story. Okay, you, you heard of him. You heard of him. That's fine. Well, sorry, what would you say? I, want, I was wondering if anybody in the comments has anything to add, but no, I don't. 
That's a good question. Yeah, if anyone knows anything about Reis uh, Sul Mikhail, write it write it in the comments. So he's an incredibly interesting figure. Let me just go to my notes quickly. So he was born from a noble line. So this is we're skipping over to the late 1600s, mid 1700s, right? Because the Ottoman invasions, the Catholicism, all that, all the stuff we previously talked about, that happens in roughly the 1500s, 1600s, right? And this is, and the reason why there is that much about Tigray in this period of time is because to the center of power in Ethiopia kept moving further and further south, if that makes sense. So Tigray became a less and less important um, part of Ethiopia. So Mikhail Suhul came from two important noble lines in Tigray. Um, and he slowly over time managed to uh, accrue power and become a powerful force within Tigray and Ethiopia. So we see after a certain point, you know, we'll, we'll skip uh, too many of the specifics, but he's, you know, a powerful lord at some point. And there was a power struggle between two dowager queens. So an emperor died. Let me check. Let's see. Uh, Eos. Eos the first died. And the, his, I think it was a previous emperor's wife. I don't remember which one. Mentoab. Very important woman. Mentoab. She was still alive. She was quite old, but she held a significant amount of power in the court. And another previous emperor's wife, uh, Altash, was also around at that time. And she had, um, whatchamacallit, she had a, a considerable amount of power. So when uh, the one emperor died, Eos, I believe, the two had a conflict with each other and rose, uh, ro uh, raised up armies from their respective regions, right? One was from Guara, I forget where the other one was, I think Gondat maybe. And the person who was asked to come settle this dispute before a battle was fought was Reisi Surmikhet, right? So he kind of becomes the power broker in the situation. And then what he does is he, he sort of settles himself in Gondar, which became the capital. This is the first time we see a real fixed capital in Ethiopia, by the way, after the Oromo invasions, because it shifted from Shawa to Gondar, because Shawa had been invaded by Oromo so heavily. Um, he situates himself in, in, in Gondar, and he makes himself the sort of, you know, like I said, power broker, of the area. And as time goes on, he grows uh, more and more powerful. And the emperor at the time, let me see if I can find his name. Um, oh, sorry, he became also uh, Raspitwodid or Inderase, which is like, you're the prime dude, basically. It's not quite regent, but basically regent, almost like Shogun, like we talked about previously in Japan. So he's the guy in charge. And the emperor is almost the figurehead. So, oh, sorry, the emperor at the time is Eos. The previous one was Eos. But um, he was exchanging messages with someone to make sure that either uh, Reesi Mikhail was returned to Degray or killed. Um, and Mikhail, of course, didn't like that. And uh, he disobeyed when it came to returning to Degray. So uh, Fasil sent an army. Another gentleman named Fasil sent an army. He destroyed the army. And then he held an assembly to basically judge the emperor. Now imagine how powerful this guy has to be where he's putting the emperor on, in, on, uh, on the stand, basically. Some comments refer to him as like the kingmaker in Gondor. Exactly, exactly correct. Yeah, he was the kingmaker. So this is the thing, though. It was determined that his betrayal was so grievous that he needed to die. So essentially, Mikhail Suhul had this man, uh, this emperor, sorry, executed. That's how powerful he was. But before, sorry, actually, I think the first thing they did was he had him um, imprisoned, which is normally what they did with nobility who, or royalty, rather, who were, um, you know, rebellious or threatened some manner, usually on top of some sort of cliff, right? Um, and I think they did a similar thing in, uh, in England. There's these towers somewhere in London, where they would trap princes and such. Um, I forget the name of them. I think it might be just the Tower of London. Or the no. It, that might be it. There's another one, though, too. It's There's funny. another one? Okay, but I think, <laughs> I think it might just be the Tower of London. Um, 
So eventually afterwards, he um, did decide that he needed to be executed. So this is the interesting thing. This is why our history at this point, it starts to become like Game of Thrones. It's so interesting. There's rivalries, there's different houses, there's grudges, you know what I mean? It's even some phrases that they have in Ga Game of Thrones kind of make sense, like the North remembers and all that. Um, <laughs> so um, Mikhail Sahul ordered the emperor killed and it was considered wrong to pierce the heir of Solomon with a spear, cut him with a sword or to strike him with bullets. So Mikhail Sahul ordered the emperor strangled with a length of red, sorry, length of silk and imperial red in January 1769. So he was strangled to death because that was determined to, to be the most acceptable way to kill someone of royal blood. Um, Got it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and his death devastated both of the dowager queens and they sort of retreated from politics at that point. Um, after that, I think he appointed the next two emperors, Johannes II, uh, who was killed really quickly, and then Tekla II. Um, and eventually the populace rebelled against him. And he had to eventually retreat back to Tigray. But this, when he killed that first emperor, that's supposed to, that's said to be the genesis of the Zaman and Masafet, the genesis of the era of the princess where the emperors held no power and uh, local lords were able to do as they please. Um, afterwards, he was succeeded in Tigray by his son, Wolde Samuel of Tigray, then his grandson, Wolde Gabriel, and by his nephew, Gerber Meskel, who eventually lost in battle to Reisi Wolde Selassie of Enderta. Um, okay, any questions before we move on to the next dude? None for me. Any from the audience? Nothing in the comments. Okay, if anyone has any questions, yeah, put them in the question box. We'll, we'll answer them later. Okay. So, Ras uh, Wolde Salase, very interesting guy. He's descended from nobility in Hintalo in, in, in Darta. So, he emerged as the ruler of Tigray, Hamasein, in the Marib Malash. So, basically, modern day Eritrea as well, um, after years of fighting. And we have accounts of, uh, of him from Nathaniel Pierce and a few other explorers. But the interesting thing about him is in his interaction with foreigners was essentially the first time we saw um, an Ethiopian entity interacting with foreigners and, and almost um, creating a, a, um, an official relationship, if that makes sense. He wasn't the emperor, but he had a relationship with um, the British. He even, I believe, asked for, let me see if I can find the exact quote. Or maybe it's the, the next guy we're going to talk about. But, um, yeah, let's see, let's see. So I'm looking at my notes here. Oh, so he was a very, very conservative Christian. And so at this point in time, the Yeju Oromos, so that's a particular clan of Oromos, had become entrenched within the Ethiopian or the Shawan dynasty and had become part and parcel of it. So they were almost like the kingmakers at that time. So the Yeju Oromos would um, empower emperors they liked. I think at one point, one emperor spoke uh, Oromifa as his first language, and it became the language of the court. Um, and uh, Reisi Wildeslasi did not like that. He was, uh, he hated them. And he, he was the gentleman who reconquered uh, Azabo and uh, Raya if that makes sense. Okay. The sort of re reconquista, and this is the sort of late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, yeah, and so he, okay, uh, as I was, uh, what I was speaking about earlier, he hosted three British diplomats. So George Annesley, Viscount Valentia, and his secretary, Henry Salt. Um, and he signed a treaty of friendship with uh, Wilde Selassie, Henry Salt did, um, and Wolde Selassie presented himself as the representative of Ethiopia at the time. And he, the other gentleman, was meant to be the representative of Great Britain. So there was also talks about inaugurating trade with Great Britain. Um, and he was smart enough to understand at that time that Great Britain was a very powerful sort of empire and that if there was 
relations between the two, it would be beneficial to him and Ethiopia. Um, he was also very realistic when it came to trade. Um, he expressed fear, sorry, I'm just going to read this quote, that his country might not be able to supply any quantity of valuable commodities sufficient to recompense our merchants for engaging in so precarious a trade because they would have to go through the Red Sea, which was controlled by Muslims at the time. The, the, the Ottoman Turks were hostile to the, the Brits. So this guy is, he's thinking about the geopolitical situation and what that means engaging in trade relations with the um, Brits. So, you know, he's not just some dude signing a thing without knowing what it means. He's really thinking about it. Um, so then what benefit was it for the Brits if this is such a risky little material? That, I don't know if trade uh, ever really was established. So I don't think it ever really happened. But for the Brits, I'm assuming that their point of view at that time probably would have been to challenge the Ottoman Turks within that area. So, and then establish uh, an easier uh, route towards India. Yeah, someone is asking uh, a time period, like what year this was? I think this is 1700s, you said? Yeah, late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, so, yeah, um, that's sort of his reign. Um, a few of his uh, descendants. Uh, also did well in Tigray, but the next big guy is Ras Sabagadis Woldu. Have you ever heard of Sabagadis? No, haven't heard of that one. Has anyone in the comments heard about Sabagadis? If you had, uh, if you have, please, please write something about him. Um, so, Ras Sabagadis is from Agame. He was Irop, right? So you know about the Irop people, right? They're uh, uh, people. Sorry, what were you saying? They speak um, Saho, right? Yeah, exactly. A Cushitic oh, language. Afar, yeah. I think it's mutually intelligible with Afar. I think so. Um, they live in um, uh, Agame, right? In parts of Agame. They're a small group. Exactly. He was Shum Agame, someone wrote. Um, so Shum just means sort of like Lord. There's no direct translation in English, but he was like the Lord of Agame. Um, but he was Irop. It's part of the Edo people. They're Cushitic-speaking people. Some of them, I think a bunch of them are Catholic still to this day. Most of them. Um, most of them. And um, let's see. Uh, he eventually became the most powerful ruler of uh, Tigray. He, like, he essentially controlled all of Tigray and small parts of coastal uh, Eritrea and parts of uh, the Eritrean highlands. So that would be Hamasi and Akala Guzai and Sirai. Um, and he rose to power after the death of Walda Selassie. Um, and he fought a series of wars with the different warlords within the region. This is sort of what was going on at the time. If you wanted to rise to power, you had to be the most powerful dude with the most powerful weapons, right? And this is a, an interesting thing. I was speaking with someone about how um, uh, swords aren't really a thing in our culture or spears. And my theory is that guns have been such a large part of our culture for so long that they've disappeared from, like, you know, have you ever been to Tigray? Yeah. Have you ever been to a party in Tigray? Yeah, there's a gun. Exactly. It's not a party until someone brings out an AK, right? So if you're a warrior in our culture, you got to have... Uh, a, a, a proper weapon. So if guns are starting to become already in the late 1700s, 1800s, a powerful weapon, then you got to have a gun. So that's sort of, um, and that's something that uh, Sabagadis realized. He realized that firearms were incredibly important to uh, uh, make him a powerful warlord and also in dealing with the Yeju cavalry because the Yeju Oromos were famous for their cavalry, right? That's what helped in the Battle of Adwa much later on about 100 years later. So he managed to defeat uh, all the different uh, Tigrayan lords, uh, Wube Hala Mariam, who ended up becoming the ruler of Tigray later on, uh, the Wag Shum. The Wag Shum is the, the Shum of the Agal people in Lasta, which borders uh, Eritre, uh, sorry, Tigray. Um, 
And we also have uh, letters we see of him writing to uh, the Patriarch of Alexandria. Uh, another one addressed to, uh, addressed to King George of Great Britain asking for, oh, this is the quote I was speaking of earlier, asking for 100 cavalrymen, a carpenter, and a church builder who will build the way you do in your country. So he's uh, like similar to the similar um, to the previous gentleman, Wilde Selassie, he's aware of the outside world. He's thinking about himself in the context of the outside world, and he's trying to develop relations with the Great Britain, not in exactly the same extent that Wilde Selassie did, but something like that. Um, then what else do we see? He eventually went to war. Sorry, did someone, uh, was there something? Um, someone said the main reason why Tigray was powerful was because it had access to firepower from the Red Sea coast. Exactly correct. Exactly correct. They, Tigray had um, access to the Red Sea coast through um, the Tigrinya speaking people also in what is now modern day Eritrea. And so they were able to trade for guns. At that time, uh, uh, Sabagadis had access to matchlock flint rifles, right? So that's a f rifle with, you know what a flint is, right? The thing that like you strike it against a, a different other kind of rock and it sparks. So you would have a matchlock flint and it's like a one shot rifle. So he had a few thousand of those, which made him very powerful. Um, and he essentially went to war w at that point with the Yeju Oromos uh, in Showa and beyond. Um, and he uh, essentially became one of the most powerful people in Ethiopia at the time. Um, and he would appoint representatives also to places like Semien, um, Semien, which is like, I think, near Gondar right now. But eventually, he had um, some other warlords in Tigray rose up against them and allied with Yeju Oromos against them. And he managed, uh, he um, fell out of power. And I think... He was killed, yeah. So his own son-in-law, Wube, uh, handed him over to uh, an Oromo lord. And on the 15th of February, they beat him to death and uh, executed him. And uh, his remains were reportedly later interred at the monastery of Gunda Gunde. Um, okay. Let's see. Do you have any questions? None from me. Anybody in the audience? I think at this point, we can sort of uh, move on to the question and answer slash discussion period. And so we'll take a look at uh, some of the questions in the question box. Um, let's see. So guys, if you have any questions about anything to Gry history, any period of time, it doesn't have to be just what we spoke about to get today, put them in the question box and uh, we'll answer them. Uh, during Zamana Misafent, what was the reason the system collapsed? So as I spoke to earlier, it said that the, the main reason was uh, Suhul Mikhail uh, executing the emperor. But I think the more in-depth answer is when the Shawan dynasty um, came to power, it was never particularly st stable, right? So we see, um, like I said, there's multiple rebellions in Tigray and, and south of uh, what would now be Amhara. Um, we, we see the Shawan dynasty moving further and further south um, in terms of, of, of the power center. Um, and Eventually, once we hit the 1500s, we see the invasion of Amer Grain, and that devastates the Ethiopian Empire. We see the Oromo invasions. So even though uh, Resimu Suhul Mikel is said to be the one who, who started the Zaman of Misafent, I'm kind of of the belief that, that Ethiopia wasn't even really stable before then. Um, hopefully that answers that question. Does that make sense, Shawit? Makes sense to me. Makes sense to me. I'm curious to like how he p managed to position himself like initially to even have that power. Was it just because he was wealthy and had resources to do so? So like I said, he, 
there was uh, the two Dowager Queens that were about to go head to head and fight. So he was sent to be the sort of mediator. You know how we do that in our culture where there's a fight between two people, there's a mediator, but he came with an army. <laughs> and then, yeah, so I don't know if I explained that. He came with an army. So then he was able to slowly sort of position himself as the sort of prime person behind, behind the throne. And it wasn't guaranteed. He had dealt with many rebellions and battles and that's how he was sort of able to put himself in a position of power, if that makes sense. Um, okay. Did Sabagadis use Adulis port? Um, depends on what you mean by use. He probably had traders go up there for sure. Um, he had control over that area for some period of time, but it was also probably contested by the Ottoman Turks. So um, I don't know if he had direct control, but he probably sent traders up there. Um, we, we do see at that point in time, the Ottoman Turks um, controlling a, a small strip of what is now modern day coastal Eritrea. And that going back and forth between um, the Ottomans and, and local rulers. And I think it was called the Islet. That's like the name for a little area in, in, uh, in Turkish, the Islet of Habasha or Hab Habshi, I think is what they say. Um, next one. What is the origin of the name Ethiopia? Does it have something to do with a guy named Ethiopia? Okay, that's a good question. So there is in the Kebra Negas, there's a part of it where it says something like, some guy named Ethiopias, Ethiopis, the son of Kush, was like the father of Ethiopia. I don't believe that personally. <laughs> um, what we see is the Greeks called an area south of them Ethiopia, meaning burnt-faced people, right? You know this, right? The, in, the important thing to remember is that Ethiopia, when they said it, and when other people said it, meant many things. It could mean Africa. It could mean the Arabian Peninsula. It could mean modern-day India. And most of the time, it referred to Sudan, the kingdom of Kush. Rarely did it ever mean modern-day Ethiopia. What happened was when Izana and multiple other Aksumai emperors um, translated, you know, remember, I don't know if you remember, we talked about inscriptions and how they used inscriptions to to sort of write their successes and such. Um, they would do it in multiple languages. When they did it in Greek, they would translate either Aksum or the, the uh, uh, Agazi to Ethiopia because they knew that was the word that the Greeks understood. Eventually, when we get to the Shawan dynasty, they fully appropriated that name Ethiopia. So we know for sure that's where that word comes from. And also the people of Tigray and the people of Ethiopia did not refer to themselves as Ethiopians until this past century. It wasn't uh, a common name. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, what language did people in Lalibela speak when the churches were built? That's a really good question. Um, so they are an Ag Agal speaking people. So there's multiple, um, and Agal languages are Cushitic languages. They're different than Saho and Afar. I think Saho and Afar are Western Cushitic languages and Agao are Eastern ones. And there's multiple Agao languages. So there's the Agao Awi, there's the Kemant, there's, I think, one called Kwara, uh, and there's one in the area of Sokota Lasta, I think, called like Hamta or something. like. That. I don't know how to pronounce it. I've only read it. Um, so they spoke, I think, Hamta, uh, uh, th that specific Aga language at that time uh, when Lalibela was being built. Um, and I think they're still around. They're probably a very small minority, but I think they're still around. Yeah, they are. Okay. Um, did King Theodros speak Tigrinya? I don't know, honestly. I wish we had Uncle here. He could probably answer that question. Um, I've heard rumors that he's got some sort of relation to Tigray, Theodros. Um, I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry. I'll look into it and, and uh, maybe we can answer it again in, in, in the next episode. Um, someone's asking something. 
What uh, is it true that some say Ethiopia included Somalia, Djibouti, Sudan? Um, Somalia, definitely no. That's a big old no, no, no. Djibouti, no. I hear the Djibouti one a lot, and I've researched it. Have you heard that as well? That some, even something like it was leased by Menelik to France for a hundred years. I don't think that's what happened. <laughs> I've looked it up. I can't find anything about that. I think Djibouti was never even in the sphere of Ethiopian read it, politics. For many. What's that? I've never read it, but I've heard it. Yeah, that's my experience as well. So Sudan, there was a brief period where the kingdom of Mero, uh, which was the kingdom in Sudan at that time, was conquered and destroyed by Izana. So, you know, he probably had some influence afterwards in that time. So Sudan, maybe a little bit. Somalia, Djibouti, no. Um, let's see. I'm trying to navigate this question box. Okay. Um, was Tigrinya ever widely spoken in the city of Gonda? Was King Fasilidas a Tigrinya speaker? Um, King Fasilidas, I'm sorry again, I don't know. Um... Was Tigrinya ever spoken in Gondor? This is interesting. Um, my Tigrinya and my Amharic aren't so good, but I have heard that the Amharic spoken in Gondor is more similar to Tigrinya than other versions of Amharic, if that makes sense. Some of the, the, the <laughs> shall we look at your face is wonderful. So like, instead of saying um, Bila for knife, Bila is knife in Amharic, they say Kara, similar to Tigrinya. And even some people there, if you hear them speak, it sounds a little bit like it's mixed in Tigrinya. So probably some influence in Gondar, in the Gondar area. Um, yeah. I don't know if they... Uh, okay. I heard... Sense. Sorry, what were you saying? It makes sense geographically. Yes. <laughs> it makes sense geographically. That's a nice way of putting it. I heard rumors... Um, that Haile Selassie has roots in Tigray. Any truth to that? I don't think so. Um, okay, so it's important to note that once we hit a certain period, the last 100-ish years, the nobility of Ethiopia are very similar to the nobility of Europe in one respect in that they're very, very mixed. Exactly. So if you look at the nobility of Europe, let's just focus on Europe. So we got all the way from UK, all the way to Russia, and all the countries in between. By the 1800, 1900s, they were so mixed that um, I think during World War I, the emperor of Germany and the emperor of Russia were first cousins and looked like twins. Yeah. And the Tsar right? in Russia was also their first cousin. Exactly. So there's a sort of similar situation in Ethiopia where they're super mixed. So Haile Selassie is part Amahara, part Oromo, part Gurage. Um, and, and we see that with all the different royal families or noble families. So I don't think he has any like close, he definitely has some Tigrayan ancestors just by virtue of being a noble and by being mixed with different groups. But I don't think he has any serious roots with Tigray, spoke Tigrinya or, or had any sort of Tigrayan identity. Indian blood? I've never heard that, <laughs> personally. Um, let me... There is, a, I think, a folktale in Gondor told about two Indurta priests. I don't know about that. Someone at, said something like that? Uncle would know this. Yeah, that's probably a question for Uncle. One day, we got we to gotta write these questions down, and then uh, we'll ask, we'll ask uh, Uncle. Um... People's uh, Nati, you ask Nati Kasai, people question his nobility, any traces of his lineage. I'm maybe you're talking about Theodros. I don't know if you want to if you want to re ask that question and tell us who this person you're asking about is, and then maybe I can answer it. Um, you also asked, was Sabagadis the last Shum Agame? Uh, no, his ancestors were Shums all the way until Haile Selassie's. Um, what should I call it? Uh, what, what, until he was deposed, um, and um, his ancestors are still around. I mean, sorry, his descendants—not his ancestors yet. <laughs> his descendants are still around. Um, 
I'll leave it at that. I don't want to dox anyone, but yeah, they're still around. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the person you were talking about, Nati, was Suhul Mikhail. They questioned his nobility and any traces of his lineage. I've never heard that, but that's interesting to hear. Um, it's odd because uh, Johannes traced part of his lineage, the a significant part of his lineage to Reisisul Mikhail. So the idea that he, his nobility was questioned is, is interesting to me. I've never heard that before. Um, let's see, De Degu135. How about the name Abyssinia? Okay. Abyssinia comes from the word Habesha, and it it's, comes from the Portuguese translation. So they drop the H, uh, they turn the SH into an S, weird stuff like that happens with translations. And then when it became anglicized, turned into English, it became Abyssinia. Um, the word Habesha, I'll just move on. Um, I was speaking about uh, this with someone, I think, yesterday on Clubhouse. Um, there's a, a folk etymology I hear constantly, and I've looked it up. I've never seen any source for it that. Um, actually, tell me, Choi, what do you know about the word Habesha and where it comes from? Do you have any... Um, I've heard some people say that it comes from, like, Arabic. Uh, I think also similar to Ethiopia, like, burnt face or, like, the dark people, something like that. Yes, that's kind of what I was talking about. They say it means, like, mixed people in, in Arabic. Doesn't mean that in Arabic, uh, for sure. And I've never seen any trace of, like, any sort of uh, uh, document that traces that word to Arabic. Um we know for sure that it was used in the last at least like 1800-ish years. So the earliest reference we see is an inscription in modern-day Yemen when I forget which kingdom because there were multiple kingdoms in Yemen at that time. And this was around the time when there was like I think four kingdoms in Yemen and Aksum and they were all, you know, invading each other and going to war. One of the kingdoms invited Aksum to come go to war with another one in Yemen. Uh, they were defeated, and I think the inscription says something like, such and such invited all the clans of Habesha, and they were defeated. So we know that it's an old, old word. We know that it refers to our people. Um, that's about what we know. I don't think there's really any connection to uh, um, Arabic. I think that's just something someone made up. So there's even, this one's a little bit, uh, more of a stretch, but bear with me. So do you remember when we talked about Punt in the first or second episode? So if we were to just operate under the assumption that Punt is in Tigray, which I don't think is a big stretch, um, I think there's an old, I don't have inscript, uh, in front of me, an old inscription from the Egyptians from 3,500 years ago that refers to a group of people in Punt who are called, and it's, it's the way it's transliterated, you can't read it because there's no vowels, it would be H-B-S-T-W, uh, right? So that would... Right now. Hmm? It's J-W, it's T-J. J-W. Oh, yeah. so you know what I'm, you found it? Yeah, I found it. And so some people think that might be a reference to Habesha or Habeshawi or something like that. It means the bearded one, so you're a good The bearded one. Okay, okay. Interesting. So maybe that might have something to do with it. That one's a bit of a stretch, though. There's some quick Googling skills, shall we? I, <laughs> I'm impressed. My skill. I should market it, eh? You should. Um, so Habesha can only be used by Tagaros. That's uh, interesting because I'll just, I'll just say it's been used recently in a very different way. So, you know, in my research, I found that even until recently, the people of Tigray didn't call themselves Tigrayans. They called themselves Habesha. They didn't call their language Tigrinya. They called themselves, they called it Kwankwa Habesha. Right? And the... Call it that? Hmm? When did they call it that? Honestly, I think before the 1900s. Tigray is a very recent, we've spoken about this with uncle. Tigray proper was Aksum and Adwa. Yeah. And because it was the administrative center, if you were used to calling the administrative center of that area with those people Tigray, you would just say that's all Tigray. 
And I think if you even speak to really old people now, if they say they're going to Adwa, they say they're going to Tigray. This is a, a lot more recent than we think. I know we're like, we're Tigrayan, what do you mean? That's why I try and talk about ethnonyms and toponyms and how they change and how identities change with it. But before that, our people just called ourselves Habesha. But the way it was used in Tigray and the way it was used outside of Ethiopia, outside of Tigray was different. So in Ethiopia, it's become a sort of pan sort of identity. So I, and I think I've always had the Tigrayan version in my mind. And the Tigrayan version is essentially that if you're not Tigrayan, you're not really Habesha. That's, I know that's not, a lot of people don't like that, but that's the way it is in my head. Right? So when I went to the south of Ethiopia, let me just check the time right quick. Um, when I went to the south of Ethiopia, I met a guy from, what's his, uh, where was he from? Kambata. And he described himself, he said, Enya uh, Habashai, like us Habashai, and when we were talking about something else, and I was like, ooh. <laughs> I didn't say anything, but in my head I was like, oh, okay. Um, so it's, be, it's being used as a, a sort of anyone in Ethiopia can be Habasha, but I think personally, if you ask lots of Tagaros, especially older ones, in their mind, if you're not from Tigray, you're not really Habasha. They might not say it out loud because we're a polite people, but and now I think the word, the word has changed and it means different things to different people. So I don't know. And this is why we see also like Oromos and other, especially Cushitic speaking peoples or non-Sismetic uh, speaking peoples not feeling comfortable with the term and not wanting to use it. Does that make sense, uh, Shawit? Yeah, it makes sense to me. Okay. Um, someone asked what might be a little bit of a lengthy answer. I'm a little... Um, the Tigaru from Tigray, the same ethnicity as Tigunya speakers from Eritrea? Um, hmm. We can say this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to find a way. Depends on who you talk to. Yeah. Let's put it like that, on both sides of the border. Depends on who you talk to. Some people will say yes. Some people will say no. Um, and they're going to have different reasons for it. I can't speak definitively for anyone on either side. Um, I would say personally me, I would just say yes, yeah. speak the same language, cultures yeah. seems the same to me. I see What's us, that? I see us as like the Punjabis of Africa. So like Punjabi people, they're split against Pakistan and India. They're definitely very different people. Um, they hold very proudly like different nationalities, but the same historical ethnic background. Yes, that's a very good way of describing it. I would agree with that. I think some people get a little bit uncomfortable with it because they feel um, that it's a way to unify those two people. But I like just because you're part of the same ethnicity doesn't mean you have to be part of the same country. No, so for that. we are definitely distinct peoples. Yeah. Um, is there a difference between people identifying as Habesha or Abesha or is it just pronunciation? Um, so that's just pronunciation. In Amharic, they tend to drop H's a lot in a lot of words that we would. So Habesha, Abesha, Hagar, Agar. There's a few examples I'm forgetting. Um, you even see that in the way the Ge'ez Fidel is used in Tigrinya compared to Amharic. So in Tigrinya, we have, um, like, the first one is Ha, Hu, He, Ha, He, Hu, Ho. And then in Amharic, it's Ha, Hu. So they even dropped the, the He and turned it into a Ha. And then you even see, um, I think all three, there's three sort of ha-ish sounds. They're all the same in Amharic. Yeah, but they're... Whereas in, in Tigrinya, only two, I think, are the same. Yeah. Um, so it's just the pronunciation in Amharic. And even in Amharic, it's not the same. It can differ between people. Um, let's see. <laughs> Uh, I think that's it. If Does anyone have any more questions? We're almost done. We got about five minutes left before we get kicked off by Instagram. Uh, let's see. Is there anything in the, the comments or did you catch them all? I think that's about it. Do you have any questions or any clarifications you want, uh, Shoei? No, I'm good. You did a great job, Namher Danny. Thank you very much, Shoei. Okay, guys. Um, just before we go, I'm going to say that we, uh, thanks to our wonderful team on United Tagaro Canada, some people working from behind the scenes, 
Oh, there's a question. One last question. Oh, yeah, the Fana is already on it. Thank you, Fana. That's what I was about to talk about. Thanks to some wonderful people behind the scenes on uh, United Tagaro Canada. We are now officially a podcast. We are available on Apple Podcasts. We are available on Spotify, Spotify and YouTube. <laughs> Did you just give us a little bit of lil? A little bit. I didn't want to overtake. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, I think also Facebook. Um, so if you want to see us, go subscribe there. You know, give, give us a nice rating. Put some comments out there so you don't have to go on, on, on Instagram in case you want to listen to us or even watch us. Um, for the people asking when you see us next, um, it's every two weeks. So we won't be on next week on Sunday. We'll be on May 2nd. May 2nd is going to be the next time we're on. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for joining us on this episode of Tariq Time. We will be back on May 2nd, as I just said, two weeks from now. And have a good night. Thank you very much, Shoei. Thank you. Have a good night.